as part of all the work that I've done into trust and brands and businesses, vision comes up very, very frequently. And I was asked recently by a major corporate to come along and talk about vision and how you could create compelling visions to really drive success for organizations that both compel the head and the heart. I'm Justin Bassini and I create and tell stories about business. I do that through my own business. I allow, I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm also a blogger. Please go to my blog, bassini.com, register. You'll get content such as this. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. I speak at events very frequently and I published my first book, which is really all about how brands and businesses can create trust by becoming purpose driven called Why Should Anyone Buy From You, which is available on Amazon. So I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so telling you two stories. It's pretty fast paced, so, so bear with me. There's going to be two of them, one about a story of a business that had a failed vision and one about a story about a vision which was truly inspirational, a leader that was truly inspirational and comparing and contrasting the processes that they went through. We'll talk about some key takeaways at the end and by the end of it, what you'll get is you'll get a much clearer understanding of what you need to do, both the good and the bad, in creating vision for yourself, for your team or your business. So look, what do you really need to do? If you've only got uh, a few minutes, this is the key things that you need to know about setting a bit vision. The first thing is that vision really works. It's proven to improve personal and business performance. Many, many studies have looked at visions and how you create commitment and how you create performance and success within business, but within your own personal life as well. And setting a really good vision and thinking through that process of how you're going to achieve that vision really works to drive that performance. The second thing is that vision really requires leadership, your leadership. It requires leadership that isn't just about standing up and shouting. It's about listening and learning and then leading. Great visions are mirrors back from the organization, mirroring back what they want and what they want to achieve and really putting that into a way that can inspire progress. And that brings us on to the next point, which is vision needs head and it needs heart. It needs to compel people to action. So it needs to have logic, but it also needs to have emotion. And then the last thing is that the effective creation of a vision is both creative, but it also needs to be pragmatic. Many, many visions have failed because they're too high level. Because what they do is they promise the world, but there's no real pragmatism there about how they're going to actually achieve it and how that vision can be used as a decision-making tool. So let's have a look at a couple of case studies very, very quickly that can illustrate some of the things that you need to do in order to create really great vision. So this first story is when vision fails and I've subtitled it the battle for the soul of the world's biggest bank or why having the wrong vision cost billions. So I'd like to tell you these couple of stories and the two main people are two heroes in this story are Sandy Weil and John Reed. Well, Sandy Weil, let me tell you a little bit about him. He was an American. He was born on the 16th of March 1933 in Brooklyn um, and what was really interesting is that he was born three months before the Glass-Steagall Banking Act. Now, for those that don't know what the Glass-Steagall Banking Act is, it was the act that Franklin Roosevelt put in after the collapse of the banks in the, 30, in the 20s and the 30s in order to separate the casino banking of investment banking and stock trading and all that sort of thing um, from retail deposit taking and from insurance. And so he split those two things in order to create firewalls between those uh, activities. And so we'll come back to why that's important, but Sandy Weil was born three months before that act came in. Now Sandy was a really, really bright guy, came from a sort of middle class um, family, and he joined in 1955 a firm which many of us will have heard of called Bear Stearns, and he went in as a broker. He was really successful. He was successful by analyzing financial accounts. So he wasn't really a salesman. He wasn't really a, a guy that you wanted to do business with, but he was really, really clever. And by the time uh, of 68, just a few years later, he had um, founded a company with a few other people, a growing brokerage firm, uh, which eventually became CB. W. L. Hayden Stone in 1972. So he's building a business. And in 1974, he took over Sherson Hamill, which was a really hundred year old firm, 
uh, a doyen of sort of Wall Street and, and the US uh, financial markets. And then in 81, he sold that company to American Express for 930 million. Um, and he made a lot of money in that transaction himself. And he spent a few years at American Express and then he left uh, and he bought the business back for 1.2 billion about a decade later. So this is a hallmark of the way that Sandy operated using his financial nows to create value and to, sh and to promise to the people who were lending him money in order to do these increasingly large transactions, promising them shareholder return. And that was the key thing that really drove him. And then he started to make his really defining moves. So he was already a sort of minor shareholder in uh, Travelers Group, and he took that over in 1994 for four billion. So what we can see is we can see these transactions getting bigger and bigger. And then he, required, he acquired a bank uh, or a, a brokerage firm uh, that many of us uh, you know, will have heard of, really, really famous firm, um, for nine billion the next year. And this was really his moment. So by buying Salomon Brothers, he took Travelers and he created a really top tier firm. And he was, you know, the, the, the biggest guy on Wall Street at that time. Well, let's have a look at his um, counterpart, who was John S. Reed. Now, John S. Reed, similar age, a bit younger. He was born in Chicago in 1939. And he was really a city corp, which was a big banking company in the US, and he was a lifer. So he was almost like a traditional bank manager. And uh, he rose through the banks of, con of uh, the ranks of Citicorp uh, in consumer banking. And really, he didn't have many claims to fame. He was an extremely good executive. But maybe his biggest claim to fame was the rise of the ATM, which he really, really pushed in America. Now, what happened was these two guys came together, they saw a transaction, an opportunity. You had Reed on one side, who was the traditional sort of banker, and then you had Sandy Weil on the other side, who was really, uh, you know, the, the archetypal big money uh, leverage and borrowing money to create bigger and bigger firms of financial services. Um, and they came together in April 1988 to create... Citigroup, which all of us, I'm sure, will have heard of in the one of the world's biggest deals, $76 billion deal. So, you know, after billion dollar deals, that really went up to a massive, massive um, level uh, to create the world's biggest financial services company. And of course, as these companies came together, they had a challenge and they said, OK, what we need to do is we need to create a new vision for this business. And so let's have a look at some of the things that they did. <clears throat> so the first thing that they did was the tension between the Sandy Weil model versus the John Reed model of sort of traditional banking was immediately apparent. And their vision was really all about competition and they were competing even from that early stages and not about collaboration. And that's the first mistake they made. They had two completely different leadership visions. So Sandy Wiles' vision was very true to himself. He'd always been the same. And he was about creating shareholder value. That was really his thing. And what John Reed said was John Reed said that he wanted to create a global consumer-focused business that helps the middle class with their finances. So again, you can see his history coming out, but very, very different competing visions. Now, here I've got a video, um, which if you want to actually see the videos, I don't have time to do them here, then please go to my Prezi presentation uh, and you can actually see the full videos. The second mistake they made was that it was top down with lots of white middle aged men sitting in smoke filled rooms. So, you know, you've probably had this in your business where the top guys go off, they lock themselves in a room and they start talking about what should our vision be? And it's all about what they think and it's all about them rather than the actual people that they need to um, inspire. And what came out of that process was really a boring production line vision based on a flawed business model. So let's have a look at what they said. They said, we strive to build the best company where the best people want to work and to be the first choice of where customers want to do business. That is our vision for Citigroup. So, you know, you can't really disagree with any of that, but it's completely generic. 
It could be the same vision for a company producing shampoo as producing financial services as producing cars. Nothing really that you could really get your teeth into and could inspire you. What I loved was I took, I went back to their annual reports and you could see that they, they was filled with buzzwords. They didn't even say that they were a business. They said we're an economic enterprise with a relentless focus, all these different buzzwords coming up really devoid of any true understanding of what drives people and really taking that heart element of really trying to inspire people. If you look at the, I did a word cloud of all their division and, and purpose statements. And what you can see is a lot of the good, good words come up, customers, community, market, but it's entirely generic. There's nothing really about what we are here to do. And that's the key thing that visions need to answer for people. And so the outcome was really a weak vision and a culture that was all about competition. And what you could see is that uh, 10 years later, massive settlements, massive fines for various misdemeanors, because you know, a lot of what was produced didn't allow people to really understand the decision making that they needed to make in order to deliver those visions. Citigroup created, uh, uh, had to have the largest bailout of, of any bank. 100 billion in cash was needed and 300 billion to cover their troubled assets. Now, still a very, very large firm. What you can also see as part of this was that, that there was a, a, a really um, almost revolving door at the top, you know, CEOs going in and that's been perpetuated even in the last few years with, with many leadership changes. Again, because the person sitting at the top isn't really driving a vision and a culture, what they're doing is they're driving a sort of big machine to create money and to take risk. Ultimately unsustainable. So that's our story of when vision fails and a few things that we can learn as we create visions for our own businesses about what not to do. Now, the next story that I'd like to talk about is when vision inspires. And this is a brand and a business that I've admired for a long time. So, and I, I titled this story, How a Surfing Climber Turned a Rugby Jersey into a Global Brand and Managed to Stay True to Himself in the Process. And I'd like to introduce you to this guy who's a, who was a climber. He's Yvonne um, Chouinard, a French-Canadian uh, born in 38, so similar to our guys Reed and Weil on the other side, but of a very different mindset. He was brought up on the west coast of America, and he was brought up in, a, in California, but very near places where he could get to the great outdoors and to some of the wonderful pl uh, landscapes that exist in that part of the world. And at the age of about 12, he was taken to this place, Stony Point, and he was as part of a field trip to learn how to uh, handle birds of prey, believe it or not. But he was taught how to abseil down one of these um, rock faces. And he, the, his imagination and his whole life was changed by that, that early expo exposure to rock climbing. He became a rock climbing fanatic. He went to the Yosemite mountains and he used to climb these unbelievable peaks. And as he started to do that, he also started to try and create equipment, um, new equipment, new ideas for equipment that he could actually use to drive his climbing forward and make some money as he went along the way. And just for those that uh, do a lot of product testing, this is one of the peaks or one of the um, climbs that he used to test his equipment on. That's uh, sort of the definition of uh, you know, putting your money where your mouth is, as it were. And by 1965, his equipment was really, really popular and he, and he went into business. So before he'd been doing it sort of a, as a cottage industry and he started to create it with, he teamed up with a friend and they created Chouinard as a brand of equipment for what they called Alpip, alpinists, so climbers and the climbing community. The business does pretty well. Um, and it was uh, the most became the most popular in America by five years later, relatively small market. But the main thing that was the issue was that it caused environmental issues. So it was all based on the concept of um, 
of stakes essentially being driven into the rock face and these were being left all up and down rock faces in America and it was actually starting to degrade the rock. Now Yvonne who had spent all his life outside was a passionate environmentalist and this was one of the key decision points. Did he want to continue with this business that was now you know turning over a few million pounds um, whilst creating these environmental issues? And they made the decision to stop all that and to rethink the products that they were using. And they'd come across this new way of climbing, this new um, equipment that was called clean climbing, where they used nuts and, and bolts to jam in between rock faces in order to create uh, a bridging point. And they became protagonists of this clean climbing, got rid of that, all the millions of dollars of revenue that they had on the other type of equipment, and really put their, uh, bet, the, bet the ranch, as it were, on this new type of equipment that was clean. And, and a climber said, a colleague of Yvonne said, climbing with only nuts and runners for protection is clean climbing. Clean because the rock is left unaltered by the passing climber. And what we can see there is we can see risk being taken for, by fighting for a higher cause. They didn't want to run a business. Yvonne didn't want to run a business that was going to cause environmental damage. And then in 1970, on a trip to Scotland, climbing in Scotland, he discovered a rugby jersey and he started um, climbing in a rugby jersey that was colourful um, but was also quite hard wearing. And so it had both fashion and, um, and functional benefits. And he brought it back and it became very, very popular. And a couple of years later, this had become a really popular uh, item of clothing. They were importing them from all over the world and they created a brand, which many of you will have heard of, called Patagonia. And Patagonia was really all about fusing new materials and functional benefits together with um, fashion. So the trend at the time was for all sort of um, climbing clothes uh, or outdoor clothes to be very muted colors and they introduced new materials and, that worked better and they introduced new colors and people really liked the quality and the fashion that they produced but in by 1991 they had over leveraged they borrowed too much money and the recession really hit them hard and they had to reduce one in five heads from the company which for them was a really really big deal for this company that had grown from the passion of, of Yvonne and as a founder of the business to have to go through that was a real crisis of confidence and so at the time what they said was they said okay we need to go back to basics and we really need to set a vision for how our business is going to be and the decisions that we're going to make and the first thing that they did in this moment of crisis was that the whole business, not just men in smoke-filled rooms, but the whole business was asked by their leader, Yvonne, to answer this question. What do we really want to do? And put notice the emphasis there on, you know, what do you want to do and what do we want to do as a company? This is not about being told. This is about listening and forming a collective vision that can compel action. And the question that they answered was, why are we here? What is Patagonia? What is our business here to be? And they tried to find a reason for being that it was truly special, truly theirs, and both fused the head and the heart together. And this is what they created, and this is still the vision. I'm not going to read this, but what I love is I love in language like that these are all silent sports so the things that they do skiing snowboarding surfing fly fishing paddling they're all silent sports none require a motor none deliver the cheers of a crowd in each sport rewards come in the form of hard-won grace this is emotional language this is language which really connects to people we want to make the best products but we want to do as little harm to the environment as possible couldn't be as different from the couldn't be more different from the city group vision so this is all about people saying about what they want to be it allows you to make both head and heart decisions and allows people to really become vested with this vision to drive their own performance and success and make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis this is uniquely patagonia's
whereas the Citigroup example could have been applied to any top company. And it allowed them to make tough decisions. So they walked the talk, they took tough decisions to ensure that they, they could remain consistent with the vision. So they give 10% of their profit or 1% of revenue, whichever is greater, to environmental causes. Three, the business has, has grown 3 to 10% consistently um, over the last 20 years, but it hasn't been 20% growth. It hasn't been growth driven by debt. 30% of staff are on job shares, so it changes the way that they um, manage staff and manage their people. They have transparency in the supply chain. Have a look at their website. It's fantastic. I'll show you a screenshot in a second. And they've limited their extension into other products. So they could have gone into loads of different other products, but what they've said is they've said we're going to stay true to those sports that really allow us to express who we are as people. So one of the things that I love about their website is that for every product, they have an environmental um, sort of scorecard, if you like, and they show you the good and they show you the bad. Now look at this, this is from their website. So what we have is we have more text, we have more copy on this page about how this product is bad rather than the good. So yeah, they're being super transparent you can see the factories that they are, that, that that make these products you can see the people you can see the balance of both goods and bads in the product that you're buying i've never seen this sort of level of transparency from any other company again videos if you want to see the full videos then have a look at um, the prezi site um, and the outcome a hugely strong and vibrant culture and loads of people are now studying Patagonia as a sort of operating model for how you can create a, a company which is really really good and strong as a business they operate in over a hundred companies 400 million dollars in revenue so it's a much smaller business than Citigroup and of course there are challenges in the massive billions of revenue but I think they can still learn from some of the things that um, more inspirational, more vision-led businesses actually actually can tell us as we run bigger companies. It's had steady growth, it's sustainable growth. One of the highest levels of staff motivation and retention in manufacturing, major environmental achievements. Vaughn set up this 1% club, please have a look at that, it's fantastic, just Google it. Um, and Yvonne still goes to work and is active in the business every day, which you can't say for Sandy Weil or John Reed. You know, still going to work in his business, talking about and leading and providing that vision for that organization. So what I've tried to do today is show you some things around how we can use stories from uh, when vision works and when vision doesn't work in our own jobs to actually create visions for our teams, for our businesses, which really will drive our success. Hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Um, please share it. Please come to the website. If, you've, if you're interested, please leave a comment. What's your experience of vision? Um, visit my website, www.bassini.com, and follow me on Twitter for these sort of presentations. Thank you.